Um, thank you. Yeah, so the recording has started. So feel free to keep yourself off camera if you'd rather not um, have your image recorded for posterity. So as I say, we've got um, Martin who's joined us uh, to help present the findings from uh, a report from the Business Agility Institute now in its sixth year. Um, and this is covering uh, 2023. So there's going to be some really fantastic insights um, that uh, Martin's going to be sharing with, uh, with us. And this, this could be uh, opportunities to confirm or understand or maybe a few learning opportunities for us or some surprises that we can discuss and share uh, during the hour we have together. Um, I believe, Martin, that um, you're open to questions at any particular time. So feel free to raise a hand or um, uh, put something in the chat. Um, um, uh, we'll, we'll have a look at that and we'll pause at a convenient time to be able to kind of air your question or, or people may be invited to unmute themselves. Anne's here to help facilitate things with me. Um, so without further ado, perhaps we can jump to the next slide, Martin. Thank you where I've got a little bit of a plug. So um, I'm based out of Melbourne, Australia, and something we like to do here is it, like acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land. Um, Australia has never really set up, sorry, never set up any treaties with the local people, um, which has led to some pretty poor results. So it's worth like, yeah, acknowledging the traditional custodians, paying respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, and then yeah, extending that respect to other Aboriginal people that might be joining us today. Uh, from Melbourne, the traditional custodians of the land are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Now, we've mentioned how to ask questions, so I don't see the little like Zoom in presentation mode, but uh, any questions pop up, so I'm just going to hope Anne or Dean, or if you just like unmute given the all new people, we should be able to just address stuff on the spot. Um, and then as we get towards the end, there'll be a bit of space there for like deeper discussion. Dean and Yeah, th thanks, Martin. So um, the last meetup that we did with, for BVSSH within the EMEA community was an open space. And one of the questions we, we posed and we explored, well, what outcomes are we hoping to focus on to achieve business agility within the organisations we work for? And some of the topics which are, we believe, quite well related to what Martin's going to sh share is uh, being able to achieve big through small. So one particular topic was uh, uh, systematizing how customers could be acquired, perhaps in a startup or any kind of change, which may also be happening in a large organization. The notion and the power of intent-based leadership. Um, so that that's a, a phrase and approach which uh, we, we may remember from the work of David Marquet from the fantastic book, Turn a Ship Around and how that might be used to free up uh, senior manager capabilities or capacity. And the other approach, which I think is gonna be a theme that we're gonna learn about um, from what Martin shares is developing a value, a value stream approach within organizations that we support. So, so listen out for these kind of themes and see how that might relate to, to the report uh, that, that Martin's gonna be going through. Awesome, let's get into it. Okay. So um, today we're talking about just to set the scene about before we jump into reports and insights, you probably want to know a few things about what is this report, who writes it, what comes out of it, how am I involved in it, uh, just to sort of stitch the picture together. So yeah, um, as Dean mentioned, the Business Agility Report is in its sixth year of publishing. So the 2023 version came out at the end of December, um, and we've been talking about it quite a bit since. Um, what it does at the end of the day is provide a form of business agility index. So it's a it's based on a broad, but like shallow survey, if you will. So like those global respondents coming in and um, any respondent comes out and answers some sort of formed uh, preset questions. And this helps to triangulate, you know, about there's a model of business agility that's built out. So we'll be talking a little bit about the domains of business agility. And um, it lets us say, right, for these various different capabilities and behaviors, organizations part by part have a certain business agility index overall. Um, there's also a lot of insights we collect as part of building this report from long form answers. So there's a couple of questions at the end of the survey that ask, what is the biggest challenge you underwent if you're like trying to improve the agility of your organization going through um, you know, business agility transformation? And then what's the biggest benefit you've had? 
So together with this, we have some sentiment analysis of what's going on, as well as some statistically significant numbers as to kind of where, where the world is going, where regions are going, how different industries are doing. Um, and this is how we can speak to overall like business agility. Um, so this is a piece of research that's built out by the Business Agility Institute. Uh, they're a global organization, so they've got some people in the UK and the US and Australia. Uh, and they're, they set themselves up as a rather fiercely independent research and advocacy organization. So sort of like Sooner Saver Happier, there's a large community of practitioner volunteers that help out with some of the research or help out with some of the community outreach events. The research is probably one of the big things and that's how I fit into this. Um, I went to a meetup six plus years ago uh, where I heard the um, CEO of the Business Agility Institute talk and he mentioned this report was being built out and I started asking a few questions about how they were doing the data analysis based on the company that I work for, Team Forum, we just sort of like helped out, volunteer provided some of the data analysis. And since then it's sort of extended to doing some of the editing work um, behind the report. What's good about this is we've had external parties come in, um, you know, sort of like data science and survey validation experts. And they've been able to cross check that basically the, the survey component of it is sound. And then the math and conclusions that we're pulling out of the survey makes sense. So. Um, which is the sort of thing that yeah, it needs a certain amount of expertise to be able to pull through. Um, something that's fun that sort of just to join the two communities here, like the Business Agility Institute and Sooner Safer Happier, they share a lot of common thinking. Um, as a matter of fact, the 2022 version of this report, the preface was written by John Smart. Um, and then when it comes to authorship, so there's Evan Labor and Reed leading a research team for the Business Agility Institute. And then there's a couple of reviewers and writers, and as mentioned, I do some of that work. Um, we'll speak a little bit more about the domains and whatnot as we go through. So if you need any questions about the survey setup, just let us know, we can address that sort of thing. What's the headline piece of information for 2023? Um, so I'll show a few graphs like this, but this business agility index that pops out or very, on the various domains of business agility basically gives you a score of like, zero to 10 on where things are heading. And for 2023, there was an, so for every year, there's been like an average index of like how the entire world is going. And in additions one through, so the past five years prior to now, there's been a slow upward shift in overall business agility. And here we go, 2023, and we have the first downward drop. So 2022 is the highest at 5.0 and uh, 2023, we've gone down a little bit. The 0.1 steps don't sound like much, but there's statistically significant big like effects that have happened here. Um, so this is the first drop ever. Um, and this caused us quite a bit of stopping and thinking like what's going on and what's behind this. And as we dropped into the like long form qualitative analysis, I guess we found like there was a very pessimistic mood for 2023. Um, it seemed like the more the optimism in 2022, that sort of exciting pandemic stuff from like 2021, that was gone. Uh, a lot of companies, like the, where there was freer cash flow and more hiring uh, from late 2022, that was now over. Um, and I think we basically heard in the in the summaries that organizations were like basically trying to protect the ship, reverting to type, saying, "Yeah, we're just going to close everything down, add a lot of control," and that that sort of part that stopped, like reduced agility initiatives that slowed people down or tied them up. And as a result, uh, a lot of like agile transformation programs and a lot of like changes to ways of working were basically being snapped back and hence why we see this drop. Now, um, for the EMEA region and particularly the UK, Europe, the, the EU portion of this, um, you buck the trend. So whilst the entire world is sort of like flipped backwards by a little bit, in 2023, there was still some rises and increases in Europe. So like, that's really great to see. Um, there is not enough information in the survey corpus to explain why that regional difference is there, um, but it should be something at least to provide like, hey, you're starting off a year having you know, broken through uh, a downward curve that's seen in the rest of the world. Um, so as mentioned, like the, uh, the work in this survey is based on domains of business agility. 
um, there's a link at the bottom if you look at the Business Agility Institute, the domains of business agility to sort of dive into further to like the specific details of what this are, what these are. But um, the way that this works is through like evolving research. This is the fourth edition of these domains. The business agility people have found uh, five domains. So engage culture, responsive customer centricity, people first leadership, flexible operations, and value-based delivery. And these are now assessed by looking at like the behaviors that are exhibited and the capabilities that are exhibited by the parts. Um, it's proven to be like an interesting chunk of research itself. It's like, how do you measure these like agility parts? Like how, how can you frame it up? Uh, which is why you see the different like components here. Um, a lot of this wording, I think, aligns a lot with how sooner, safer, happier principles work. Like um, sooner is very much value-based delivery. Safer is very much flexible operations, particularly this like concept at the bottom of that column of balancing um, governance and risk. So not tying yourself up too badly. And then happier, like engage culture and having that people first relationship really fix it. Um, Across the board, maybe just a quick feel, um, we see that the average maturity ratings here are like from 5.5 on like the champion and customer part, and then the flexible operations, particularly uh, funding work dynamically and the parts that have been drawn down quite a bit. Uh, so what's changing across this whole board, or what's the summary story of these changes? What we're seeing for 2023 is that organizations are working towards like you know more psychologically safe learning environments. So there's still like quite a bit of an incentive on, I guess, improving people's skills, uh, improving their individual capability of doing work, which is kind of like on the left hand side, like cultivating a learning organization, mm -hmm. realizing people's potentials, fostering authentic relationships. This is where like you've got. Um, relationships not only within an organization so if i'm working with my peers if i'm working with people in different business units uh, or even if i'm working with external suppliers there's been a lot of increase and this has been an ongoing trend for the past few years in this spot but when it comes to collaborating that's where those metrics have been dropping so like the acting is one we're collaborating together across the organization that's seen a downward pull um, with the ability to sense and respond proactively, which is more like, you know, am I, res am I reacting to changes in the market when they hit me? Or do I have early leads feelers out there that I can get a sense of like which way the market is going? Uh, that has dropped as is the ability to like be able to have more flexible funding processes. Because when you have got more flexible funding processes, you tend to have better structures in place to be able to alter the work and again, respond to changes in the market. Now, um, after a bit of talking there, I'm keen to sort of like sense check with everyone here. How does that echo with the way you see the world like happening in the UK and Europe? Does this sound right? Uh, have you heard something different? Because this will really help sort of like which way we steer the rest of the conversation. Basically, if you completely disagree, I'd love to hear now because this would be really interesting. If it sounds familiar, then it also helps which way we go. Any comments? I can't see the comments, by the way. You might have to unmute. Nothing in the chat so far, but um, anyone, feel free to unmute yourself and just uh, share your reflections of what Martin should. And if it surprised you, does anything, does any of this kind of help confirm your suspicion, whether it's kind of anecdotal or other pieces of research that you're that you're familiar with responding? I think I've personally got so much different data coming at me that I could probably find data that fits with what you've just explained. <laughs> uh, okay. But the emphasis on uh, psychological safety and authenticity is certainly something. So I work in the UK public sector and okay. um, authentic leadership is certainly something that seems, seems to come up as a, a recurring theme. Um, I think the data I've probably got in, in terms of ad adoption of other agility um, varies down to the movement of individual practitioners. So if, if an organization has, has got a conscientious, leading, agile um, you know, champion at the center of it, then it's doing really good stuff. If that person leaves, they probably do less, less good stuff. So it's, it's 
probably not fitting with the, the broader trend. That's um, actually a really good call out. The leaders do have an outsized influence, particularly um, if an organization is changing the way it's working, you know, agile transformation, something like that, new ways of working. Um, it takes a while for that whole change process to really embed itself. So we'll pick up on that a couple of times. But thanks for the comments, Tom. Anne? Oh, thank you. I was just going to chip in an observation around um, the kind of reducing level of collaboration. And I think on the face of it, that sounds like it might be a bit of a negative thing. But actually, might it be a positive in that, might it be that some organisations are perhaps recognising the cost of collaboration and being a bit more intentional about, about their use of collaboration and maybe doing a bit more coordination or cooperation you know, being a bit more appropriate in terms of when they actually collaborate. That's a really good take on it because um, to, to be like very transparent, we saw the drop of collaboration as like a, a negative, uh, but it might be more aligned with like being very choosy as to what you invest in and what you decide to do as opposed to everything. Um, yeah, that's probably something else to pick up on. Yeah, particularly in these times where um, you know, funding is tight and people are having to be be careful. So, yeah. It, yeah, it could in some ways be a positive thing. Yeah, don't do everything. Mm. All right. Yeah, thanks for all that. Like, it's it's just really interesting to hear like the what we pull out when we stop and do this question. Uh, at the initial launch, it was very global, so you had some very different stories coming in from around the world. Um, so, for the next little bit, we'll sort of dive into like what do the highest performing organizations do? So sort of like similar to the, if you're familiar with the state of DevOps or research that was like six, seven, eight, nine years ago, along with the book Accelerate that was published. Um, I really like their focus on like, what do the highest rating, what do the high performers do? And when it comes to like overall business agility, um, there's a few things that really stand out. The first one is that the high performing orgs tend to have that any change program gets sponsored by the highest possible level. So a board of directors, if it exists, uh, the CEO will be the pusher of it uh, if the board isn't there. And I think what they found is like, while a lot of like, particularly a lot of agility incentives might or initiatives might have started from like the bottom up, like so that certain you know, people organized and teams start to realize that, hey, we can implement this and we can do better work. When it comes to particularly larger organizations, um, eventually that needs sponsorship from the top in order to help like unblock basically changes or, or collaboration between different divisions or business units within the corporation. And this we see really, really strongly. Um, if the top is against the change, then um, it'll be very, very hard to succeed. But there's been some excellent stories like coming out of Europe in the past decade, like the Royal Bank of Scotland gets talked about a lot, uh, ING. Um, where like the the senior leadership of the corporation like decided to go on all in on this and they saw they reaped the rewards from that investment. Um, the other big trend, uh, sorry, the other big thing that the, the top performers do is they tend to, when it's a large organization, transform multiple business units at once, usually thinking along lines of value streams. So if you have a particularly large org, uh, like say you're talking 10,000 plus style world, uh, the first, the first thing you'll be looking at doing is if agility is being implemented only inside of technology, then you'll do some great things inside technology. But then the change will be sort of like limited the minute it tries to exit that, involve more of the business if there's a biz tech divide. Um, when we look about at overall business agility, it's really about like exiting the world of technology. Technology like practitioners have been the forerunners of the agility movement for a long time. But yeah, business agility, we want to see it across the entire organization. Um, so if there is a transformation program underway for a large organization, connecting it across a values team, across multiple business units, tends to lead to greater success because you have this like path to delivering something that gets cut through. Um, really large orgs don't tend to transform the whole thing at once because it is a massive change. Uh, but then depending on the size, it could be an issue that's pushed across all at the same time. The, sum, the less summary lesson here still being transforming multiple business units at once in order to get something out to actual customers is a really common thing that the highest rated organizations tend to do. The last thing they tend to do is they tend to score highly in the three key predictive indicators of business agility. 
Now, what's that? So the survey is triangulating across 18 capabilities across the five domains of business agility. Um, of those capabilities, we found for five years running, so this was not done in the first edition of the report, but for five years running, we've noticed a high correlation between there's a few capabilities, a few areas where the top performers consistently score really highly on. And this has helped to build up the hypothesis we've been able to test that if you have these three things, the odds are really, really strong that your whole organization uh, has broader agility, which is another way of flipping things around to say, if you're not sure where to invest or not sure what to sort of like start off with, uh, usually picking one of these three key predictive indicators, if it's something within the realm of change, is more likely to net the better results through an agile transformation. Um, so what are they exactly? Um, it's the ability to fund work dynamically. So if you have a really, really fixed funding process, you know, that's running on an annual cycle that like proposals have to get in with full business cases nine months beforehand, so that your time, your lead time between having an idea and even being able to execute on that is like 18 to 24 months you don't have the ability to fund work dynamically. Whereas other organizations are very much investing in you know, a quarterly planning cycle, something that can alter itself and you know, adapt itself to the market. So still provide room to get work done, but also have the ability to reroute funds, you know, particularly mid-year. And this is not easy to do. Um, organizations like, or movements like Beyond Budgeting have been working on this for a while. Uh, but it's definitely one of the, it is the uh, key predictive indicator of business agility. Then uh, the other two are the ability to adapt strategies seamlessly. It might feel a bit linked, but you know, again, if you're planning out, you've got a flat, uh, inflexible one to three year ahead looking business plan, um, you won't be able to respond and adapt to changes. So the ability to adapt your strategies and then be able to have feelers out there, you know, some sort of feedback loop running where you can sense the way the world is going, you know, via your product or via other mechanisms and then adapt to it. Again, those are the, the predictive indicators of business agility. There's been a few changes with these key predictive indicators as like the sort of models and what we've been looking at have evolved. Um, other in the, the past years, other elements. So funding work dynamically has been there since day zero. It is the number one thing I would recommend people investing in. But um, in the past, we've also saw having a culture of relentless improvement. So do you have cycles in where you do a retrospective, you know, and then focus on one thing to improve it? That was a very, very strong key predictive indicator and it still like reads out pretty well. And structuring yourself against value streams was also a very strong indicator for a long time. Martin, sorry, can I, I'm struggling to find where the raise hand thing is. That's my complete... Oh, just... It's like one of the Zoom button things. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Pete. So, yeah, sorry. Can we just go back to that previous slide? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty familiar with the Accelerate and all the DevOps work from way back. And I know it was very sort of scientific and data driven, and I really like the approach they had. Um, I'm a bit behind the curve on this. Are they, is this the same methodology that, that we've looked at? companies that for whatever what good looks like that we think they're good in terms of business agility and these are the three things that came out as sort of you know predictive or how, how did this come about because i'm su surprised about funding work dynamically because I, I i seem to remember from a previous slide that was quite low on your score and i met very few organizations yeah. that can do this so so yeah this is a surprising one to me yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, so maybe just to connect a little bit with what the state of DevOps people did, um, because they were looking very much inside the technology world, you know, what makes high performing um, engineering organizations. And they did, they ran this via survey, which is actually kind of like the genesis for the business agility report. Yeah. Um, because we sort of sat down like, it's a great piece of work that they've got. How do we extend that to the entire, like the entire organization, sort of busting out of the, the realm of just engineering, if you will? Uh, so the survey does like ask questions and triangulates on like we have eighteen different capabilities here, and yeah, funding work dynamically is what the high performers do. Now this year we had a retrograde 
activity happening, you know, across, uh, I guess, the market. So overall, business agility is dropping, right? If I look at the entire corpus globally, um, then there's a drop there. But that doesn't mean there's no high performers, right? It's actually quite a broad variance band around this like 4.9, like sort of where the, the average of the world is. Um, there's still a good chunk of like organizations that are like coming out rating themselves quite highly. Uh, a few of them are known to us. So like there's also an external cooperation against what they're doing. Um, and we're purely looking now at like, what are these high performers doing? So on this like zero to 10 scale, it's basically like the people that are rating seven and above are picked up as high performers. And we triangulate just on their responses. And out of that, that's where we get like, okay, out of the 16 capabilities, it's pretty powerful how many of them rate strongly on these three indicators. So, so a bit of stats. Sorry, um, the, are, are these inputs? Because if you asked a, a, an organization, I'm just trying to work out if this was an input to what good looks like, or was this just a, a happy um, thing we found? I mean, you could say that high performing, I know in, in the world of DevOps, it's, you know, you, you're releasing hundreds of times a day, but that wasn't yeah. the definition of high performing. High performing was low code breakages, et cetera, et cetera. It just so happened there was a correlation. If you, if you release code lots of times a day, you got the other things for free. So is this yeah. an input or is this an output, this fund work dynamically? Is, is this, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, the question. Right, right. Um, if I'm getting the question right, it's these three are inputs, right? So if the organizations that do this well, that tend to invest in this and have this functioning quite well, um, will tend to get the rest of them for free, if you will. Okay. So hence they'll yeah. score strongly, yeah. Yeah, okay. That, that's just, yeah. And it, then it, it surprises me. I work with, you know, a, a bunch of, I mean, Dean and I worked together with a few customers and since then I've, you know, but I've not met any organization that I think does this well. I go in with my sort of, you know, transformation sales pitch as it were and say, oh yeah, you're going to be able to change on a dime for a dime, which was Craig Larman's quite clever little phrase on, on what agility is all about. And I've never met any customer that actually does that in practice. They, they change what they work on, but they still have the same funding. They still have the same three three agile teams or 10 or 100 it's, it, it's so i'm surprised but delighted that this is in, in your survey I don't, I don't want to derail this sorry too long so yeah, yeah. maybe, I, I, maybe I i'll take it offline but this is this is interesting yeah all very good uh maybe when to, to, to drop in a little bit more like what does funding dynamically mean you know you, you're probably not going from today to tomorrow like massive pitches like, like we're not we don't see like people increasing, decreasing their spend on a dime. It still tends to be working towards an overall budget, but where is it like directed to? Um, and it's, you know, what good looks like here is probably moving from like a fixed one to three year plan uh, to something that you can change the ship and move it around like every quarter or something, right? So that's like, you know, it's not tomorrow, but it's within like a nearby-ish realm. If that helps to call it. Yeah, like sorry, I, I derailed you. Sorry about that. No, it's a really good question because, like, this is where we come back at the end of the day. If you were to invest in certain things inside an organization where you start, it's always the question that pops out of this. Um, usually, the factors behind these three is where you get the best bang for the buck. And then that can sort of help you inject into a quarterly planning process, or if it's missing, implement a quarterly planning process. You know, something there that balances having time for delivery. Uh, but also being able to change. Cool. I love the questions. Um, a little bit more on like what we've seen inside the survey demographics, because the next couple of sections here are more to challenge assumptions, I think a lot of people end up building up. Um, and the first one we're going to like just quickly mention is the relationship between business agility and company age. Uh, so this one here, the thinking when we walked in, it was that younger companies, startups and whatnot, uh, would be able to exhibit more agility than older ones. But that's not what the information tells us, just FYI. Uh, like companies that have existed for less than 10 years tend to exhibit less agility than the ones that are in that sort of like middle age, if you were of like 10 to four years old, um, which is where like we really see a peak. And then, you know, sort of like beyond that time frame, you know, the organizations that have been around for 50 or 100 years um, is all kind of a little bit stable with them. 
Uh, but yeah, the key message here is that a younger, fresher company does not necessarily mean they're exhibiting more agility, which really like is something that I found a little bit counterintuitive, but we've been able to reinforce this over and over. Um, another interesting shift in the demographics is that the size of the company no longer has any effect. So at the global scale, um, company size doesn't relate to business agility. So I can't say that a company with like less employees, 10 or 50, um, is more or less agile than a company with like 50,000 people. Uh, again, that's a global trend. It's something that's been shifting. Um, when we started the first three years of this, smaller organizations were definitely exhibiting more nimbleness and more agility. But then as we sort of went through the pandemic uh, years, the effect really started to vanish and reduce itself, particularly across like the larger organizations. And then I think we can come out and say, like looking at what happens in 2023, the effect on size um, has like completely vanished, I guess, from a global perspective. From a global perspective. Um, again, uh, a lot of the hypothesis behind in here seems to lie that uh, during the pandemic, it had a strong disrupting impact. Uh, a lot of companies did fail. And then in the long form comments we collected across 2020, 2021, 2022, uh, there was a bit of a like a, a comment on this, like, you know, we are adapting, uh, agility practices are kind of like here to stay, like organizations were kind of like adapting to survive, and those that didn't survive are no longer inside the survey corpus, if you will. Um, but it's also probably an indication that agile ways working and transformations are increasingly taking hold, so people are across this idea one way or the other. It's not just a startup thing, larger companies are participating. It's just like more of the new normal to consider this in Saudi way. Um, and then time on journey is worth mentioning. So change takes time. Um, it's like you just follow a traditional Cotter style change management. Uh, you'll have this sort of figure in that, you know, by the time it's a, a completely different way of working, a massive like organizational change is implemented, uh, it can take a while. Like this is sort of like the that eight year mark uh, before a change is completely embedded and very hard to like undo. So organizations that have like had agile ways working embedded for more than eight years tend to like stay on that course. Microsoft's like one of the classic examples of a lot of the European banks, again, are sort of kind of like in this bucket. Um, but that's, if I come to you and say, hey, make these changes and you could reap some benefits eight, year down, eight years down the road, it's not a very good pitch for that sponsor, right? Uh, it's not a very good pitch for the people that are going to like have to put extra effort in because it's so far away. So we've been really, really keen as part of the survey to see like when do benefits realize themselves, like what are the realization steps. Um, and in past years, we saw two big inflection points. So two years in, there was the first tranche of like benefits, something there that was worthwhile. And then like, yeah, this big eight years down the road, organizations on the journey uh, are reporting high agility uh, and have been on doing it for more than eight years. Like that is another big step. But um, what we've looked at more in 2023 is we've been able to sort of decompose what that old two-year step was into a one and three-year step by just looking at like their, I guess, the responding capabilities underneath there. So um, what we can comfortably and confidently say now is that the first tranche of useful benefits show up one year in, uh, and this is inside the people first like leadership domains. This is where like you know a change is initiated. Um, leaders invest in improvement and they make a big, like they will come in and help support the journey, but the benefits are reaped right there inside of leadership within a one year time frame. And then at the three year mark, there's another big significant benefit level that tends to be along the lines of the, the parts of the organization that respond to customers, that customer centricity part. And then eight years later, you tend to have like, you know, agile ways of working start to become part of the DNA. Um, to sort of add a bit of demographics to this, so over half the people that respond to this report uh, have been on this journey for at least three years, and over 10% of them have been doing this for over eight years. Um, yeah, what's, what's fun about this one year mark is a big change program saying like, I want to like alter the way of working actually takes a long time to get off the road, like just you know, from idea to action to, I guess, having executive buy-in um, that will usually take, you know, six to 18 months. 
So being able to say that there's benefits really early on while this thing is being kicked off is a great, I guess, piece of information to hold in our tool set as practitioners, right? We can confidently say that, you know, leadership will tend to improve within that first year. And that's a very short time, I guess, at large corporation scale or even human scale. Uh, actually, probably something else to, to add while I'm on this. Um, now that the report's been running for over six years, um, we've got a corpus of 45 organizations that have responded at least three times over those six years. So we're sort of starting to build this like time series data set. And what's important about this is we can start to ask the question or answer the question, hey, is this overall investment in agility worth it? And the answer is like a resounding yes. So over the 45 companies that we've tracked, uh, three quarters, sorry, two thirds of them have shown a significant improvement, the average of which is like 27%. So there's that, you know, two thirds are moving up and they're doing really, really well with it. Um, another slice about 12, 15%, there's no real effective change. So not everybody benefits from this, right? Like there's a lot of implementation factors. And then, yeah, it's a small tail of uh, organizations that have seen a drop. But I think if you're looking you know, statistically, is this investment worth it? Am I likely to get a return? The answer is a resounding yes. Um, so what does all this stuff mean for India? Um, like I mentioned at the start, there's been overall growth, like, you know, like improvement in the business agility scale or index across Europe and Middle East and Africa. Uh, Europe is actually super important in terms of respondents to the survey. So just a bit under 25% or a quarter of respondents come from the European region. Um, and yeah, we can see that Europe has gotten a bit of a plus, so like an, an upward growth. Not enough to unpack as to why this is, is a global scale, but it's sort of nice to see, you know, other the respondents, that large corpus coming in from Europe, uh, there is overall still some positive feel coming out there, whereas the rest of the world is much more pessimistic and negative. Um, there was an interesting, so that I went looking for like what else could be interesting in Europe for this group. Um, and I mentioned earlier on that at a global scale, there's no impact on the size of the organization to this agility. But when we look purely at the European region, uh, yes, there is an impact on the scale of organizations. So, um, for Europe, large, as in like I'm talking 1,500 plus size companies, they do seem to have like a, this, this, I guess they pull the index downwards. So larger organizations aren't exhibiting as much agility. Uh, to contrast this with other regions, if you look at Asia and Oceania, uh, the large organizations actually like increase the overall agility. They tend to score higher than the smaller ones. So this is all ending up sort of like, uh, I guess, neutralizing the effect of company size globally. But when we look at European companies, it tends to be the smaller ones that are exhibiting more agility. So the ones that are under 1500 people. Uh, again, I would love to know if that's sort of resounding within you know, the cohort, the people that you're working with, but it's something that was quite interesting across the data that we picked in. If there's any questions or comment about that, or maybe wait for the end, but yeah, I'd love to see if that correlates with your personal experience. Um, so we're getting to the last segment of information and insights. And this is where I speak, uh, or we speak of benefits and challenges. So everything we've seen so far inside the report comes from like um, multiple choice questions that triangulate on the different capabilities around the domains of business agility. For, business, for benefits and challenges, it gets flipped around a bit, it's sentiment analysis. And respondents are asked, like, what is the one benefit of your agile transformation journey? And what is the one biggest challenge you've pulled out? And then we summarize the long form text on this and sort of start grouping it into categories. Um, and this is also like, again, the sentiment analysis comes from this long form text of like the overall negative or positive feel of the year. So um, benefits first is always the most fun. Uh, these are sort of like relative scales because we can't really count the numbers of people that are, are sort of the respondents that are coming here. It's more like which one has seen, uh, what is the sentiment that we see the most frequently relative to the other ones. 
So um, the number one benefit has been business outcome and val like business outcomes and overall value. So when people say benefits, they're quite happy. They, they see the business agility transformation it has had a benefit to the organization. And what's great about 2023 is that we can clearly see the financial benefits are included in this. So business outcomes and value, customer satisfaction have been near the top um, for the past few years. But the change here is that people are speaking specifically of, we are seeing more financial benefits come through as part of this investment. Financial benefits are great because they let you say with decent confidence, that if we invest in improving the way of working, if we make the organization more nimble, uh, we are likely to make more money. <laughs> and that sort of thing really helps to bring on a larger cohort of supporters than not being able to speak to finances. Um, the other interesting ones, so the, the overall trend of like customers are more satisfied and employees are happier, that helps to like, you know, do you have the workforce that's enthusiastic about uh, servicing customers, they tend to have like better collaboration across the organization. So again, this is to contrast, you know, at the overall scale, collaboration is down for 2023. But when people speak of benefits for those cohorts that are doing well, uh, that collaboration really does come through. So the investment in business agility, you know, the practices that stick towards it, the whole sooner, safer, happier uh, initiative, the companies that do well in this space tend to exhibit stronger collaboration and buck the trends of the negatives in the years. Um, and the last one that's really worth noticing, noting here is that there's also a clear support for experimentation. And this is new inside the sentiments that we're picking up. Uh, by experimentation, we mean like the, the culture of the organization allows people to go in, experiment, test and learn versus having to have a solid business plan before you know, being able to start anything. I think this is really useful for us as practitioners, right? Like it's very easy to walk in somewhere and say like, why don't we just run a short experiment with this? But if the company's DNA doesn't support that, you won't get that off the ground. Uh, being able to point to like the investment in more agile ways of working, supporting this experimentation, I think helps to unpack, you know, where do we move next? Uh, how do we find out what you know most affects where the investment from which investment most affects our customers by being able to run you know and having a culture of leaders that support like uh, experimentation we get to see I guess the overall benefits pull through of that so I'm quite excited to see that one show up here even though it's at the bottom of the top ten now uh, speaking challenges near the end uh, what do we see come through here. So a few things about challenges. The top two challenges, and this has been for like you know, the, the past several years, uh, Pete will get to you in a second. The leadership and management capabilities as well as resistance to change have been like the top two challenges since we've been picking up this information. Um, so much so that we think like, you know, that they're hard to directly affect. It's sort of like the thing, you know, the, the, the trend that companies speak of. And then the next set of challenges sort of speak to the component of that, right? So um, if I have unsuitable practices and processes, people will tend to say, to, to blame the leadership for not adapting to this. So I think as we look at challenges, we're comfortable, we're likely to keep on seeing an ongoing trend of people saying that the leadership management is a challenge that overall like leadership mindset, change mindset, resistance to change are high up there. What I think is most useful for practitioners is then being able to unpack um, what are those other component challenges? What are the things that we can address, right? From like practices and processes, those are fantastic. If you've got unsuitable practices or you know, processes that aren't evolving, um, and this connects quite a bit with like the sort of safer, happier idea of moving from a PMO to a value realization uh, office or being able to implement lean controls. Like if you, if processes just keep on getting longer and more complicated, you're gonna have challenges in getting stuff done. If you have the ability to be able to look in there and run some process improvement, you're already like moving ahead. You're able to like, you know, just put in the controls that you require, just the cross checks that you need. Um, on unsuitable organizational structure, what this tends to mean is that it's hard to, it's just to the flow of value is impeded, usually across business units. 
um, but also particularly strongly speaks to people that say that, that, that speak to this in their challenges tend to say that there's a strong business technology divide, like there are two tribes instead of being something that works together to get something done. Um, we say inclusivity here. This is not inclusivity in terms of like um, diversity and inclusivity, that sort of style. What this is, is when we need to work together, can we include other business units? Can we include the people that, you know, other parts of the organization, that sort of other that we need to work together to get something done, or are we very insular? So this is inclusivity across the organization. And that, yeah, it's kind of a bit disappointing personally, but it's so strong still, the business technology divide element of this. Um, a lot less people are saying it's a challenge to work between business units that attack against, or that work for different customer segments. The, the strongest portion of um, the inclusivity part is very much the business technology divide. And then other things start to pull through here, like the funding mechanisms. So if adapting funding is a challenge, this sort of connects across to having like flexible funding processes, adaptive funding processes, then they'll likely start to surface up as one of the bigger challenges in getting stuff done. Um, the last one to talk about here is organizations that are like being challenged tend to still find it difficult to attract, to attract the right people to do the work. So even though at, as a global stage, you know, we're looking at a bit of an economic downturn, um, you know, in 2022, people were saying it's really hard to hire the right people. Uh, in 2023, people are still saying that, right? It's like, it's still hard to find the right individuals that have the right skills to make my agile transformation succeed, or just to be able to like, to meet their expectations of the sort of individual roles and capabilities they think they need to make the organization set, it, set, set itself up for success. Um, so unpacking that was, I guess, is still important to keep at the back of your mind. You know, while there's layoffs, uh, organization agility still seems to be seems to be like impeded by the ability to attract the right form of doers. Um, there's a bit of related research across this. So there's some stuff that the Scrum Alliance um, had sponsored. And they were looking into, like, I guess the, the, the instigator for them was, uh, you know, Scrum Masters, that that skill on its own would seem to be dropping a little bit in demand. And they wanted to, like, look into that a little bit more and learn more about it. And I guess what they found, um, it's worth mentioning here, is that the high demand skills tended to be pie shaped, as in like the numerical symbol pie. So we might be familiar with the concept of a T-shaped individual that's got like one deep chunk of domain knowledge somewhere, and then has some broad capabilities across to help to stitch the parts together. When we say pie shaped skills and capabilities, it tends to be those two like individuals that have like two domain depth, uh, depth of knowledge skills. Uh, tend to be in the highest demand. And what can this look like? This could be like um, an engineer with like the Scrum Mastery skills, you know, a product person uh, that's like both good at product management, but being able to have the product ownership capability inside a team. That tends to be the sort of skills that uh, the separate Scrum Alliance survey was talking to and tends to be the sort of thing that we hear in the challenges come through across the Business Agility Report survey. Um, it's like, it is hard to find, you know, a couple of the key roles that really seem to make the organization work. What those key roles are will vary organization by organization, but then it tends to be uh, this sort of uh, combined skill set of people. Um, I'll stop there because this is it for when it comes to me talking about challenges and benefits and the overall report. Um, just to quickly summarize and then revert back to questions like Pete's. Um, so what have we seen in 2023? So there's been an overall drop in business agility. Uh, you know, the index has dropped. We hear a lot of pessimism, you know, cuts to funding, cuts to people. However, the positive thing that should really help us rally around is, well, for Europe, there has been an overall increase. Your region's doing well. Um, but the high performers, they continue to reap the benefits of their investment, right? They still have more satisfied customers, happier staff and partners, and overall tend to post better business and financial results. Um, we can say that benefits arrive quickly, and particularly this like now division where we see a set of benefits, a tranche of benefits showing up in the first year, and then the third year of like a change program uh, means that for the people that are sponsoring it, you get to see and usually speak to benefits quite fast. 
um, we can consistently and reliably say that overall investing in an organization's agility, being able to do things sooner, safer, and happier is worth it. Um, and then lastly, if you don't know where to invest, the three key predictive indicators tend to be the place. So dynamic funding, adapting your, having a mechanism that can adapt your strategies, and you know some forerunning parts so you can get early feedback on the work that you're doing. Um, questions? And Pete, I'm going to point to you. Yeah, thanks. That was really interesting, Martin. Just can you just go back a couple of slides to the benefits? Um, it was the 100%. speed to market or the sort of, you know, time to get value out. I guess that's embedded in the top one, is it? Or pros? Because it didn't seem to be a specific benefit. You know, we get stuff quicker than an 18 month. You know, we ask for something and it we can get it delivered within a few sprints. Have I missed it somewhere? Or Actually, yeah, you, that's a, a really good question because speed to market um, over the past few years has dropped out of these lists as something that people explicitly mention. Um, oh, it me? Market was explicitly like mentioned there. Um, and now it's not so much inside the sentiment analysis, but it's also not mentioned as a challenge, right? Like yeah, it's like it's inherently slow. Um, I that's yeah, it's a good call. Um, if I was to hazard a guess, I think the speed to market has sort of merged itself into the concept of like the overall business outcomes and value. Like if I feel I'm getting the, the value I want, it's, or I'm intending to get, it's probably because it's showing up in a sensible time frame, and hence the reason why it's sort of merging away in its own. But um, yeah, it's it's a really good call out in terms of sentiment analysis and happy to talk about that. That itself has been, yeah, we see less, uh, like significantly less conversation about um, the whole time effect. Thank you. Thanks for the question, um, Pete. We, we've got about four minutes left. Um, Martin, if you don't mind, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, For sure. I, I, I'm understanding that those who have participated uh, in a server are, are self-selecting themselves and they're self-reporting, or maybe they're unselecting themselves after reporting on previous um, occasions. N knowing that's an inbuilt um, uh, characteristic of the reporting, have there been any measures to mitigate mitigate? mitigate, recognize and mitigate that those, those factors? Yeah, it's a good demographic question. Um, I think like any survey that looks into a specific spot, um, you know, like people do have to elect, you know, learn the survey exists um, and then respond to it. I think what we've seen, and this is similar to like similar surveys, right? Again, I, I like mentioning the state of DevOps one. Uh, because like the survey does get emailed out to people that have responded in the past, you know, like it is also a self-selecting group. A lot of this social science research is self-selecting to a certain extent, but we gain confidence in it twofold. Uh, first is because you do see the bad, right? Like um, I think I'd be personally quite worried if it was all like roses inside the respondents. Uh, we definitely have like organized people that are responding on behalf of organizations that are like, nah, there's some real challenges here. And there's a few organizations across the corpus or a good amount of organizations across the corpus where there's two individuals responding on behalf of that organization or three or four. And they tend to be like reasonably aligned in terms of what their like the, their feel for the organization pulls through. And this is great because it helps it gives us a bit more confidence, right? that we are actually reading the mood of these self-selected individuals are representing the market in this space. I guess if like ways of working, agility, doing things sooner, safer, happier wasn't on your radar, then you wouldn't see this sort of survey and hence you wouldn't be responding to it. So yep, that entire cohort's not there, but you know, for practitioners that are interested in this and you know, I think we're really trying to push through uh, as our joint communities is having all of organizations, not just engineers and technical people, look at better ways of working. I think we can be quite confident in that corpus. It's also why um, for the past several years, we've engaged data science specific organizations to review the survey and help us you know, cross check it and make sure it's well structured so we can speak to this with confidence. Thank you, Martin. Two minutes to go, perhaps we've got time for one more question. I see Tom, you have your hand raised. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I just you, you mentioned the three um, factors that that are prevalent in high performing organisations. When you say high yep. performing, what, how are you measuring that high performance? Oh, right. Um, so high performing for this um, survey is organisations that have an overall score of seven or above out of this like 10 point scale. So if at, you know, uh, the global okay. norm this year is like 4.9, our high performers are the seven and above cohort. Right. Okay. Useful. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for the question, Tom. I think we ought to respect people's time, whether it's very, very early in the morning or, or perhaps in the uh, kind of early evening uh, for, for many of us. I just want to say, Martin, thank you so much for the great work that you've done. I know you've got up um, before dawn, not just at the crack of dawn, but before dawn to, to do this. Uh, um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much for the ongoing work that the Business Agility Institute's doing for the community, really great insights, really great um, um, inspiration and lessons that that, uh, that, that the Institute's allowing everyone to learn globally. I also wanna say thank you to Anne, Kate and Zolt for supporting this. Um, really good work that they're doing to continue to support the community as well. And um, we would just like to invite you to listen out for um, on the various different channels about events which may be happening in EMEA. And once again, just want to close by saying thank you so much, Martin. Really great stuff. And good evening and good morning, all. Thanks, all. Thanks, Martin. Thanks so much for your time. Thank yeah, you so much, Martin. Thank you. thank you. If you've got any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out. I'm on LinkedIn or Martin at team.